So we just got a ton of new Cyberpunk 2077 2.0 and Phantom Liberty information about the Relic Tree, level caps, new areas of Night City beyond Dogtown, new Badlands segments, new minigames, third person vehicular combat, the new Netrunner combo system, and so much more. So in today's news update, we'll be going over every little tidbit and morsel of information. As you guys may be aware, the Phantom Liberty World Tour has kicked off. And as a result, community members from all across the globe have and will be invited to these events in the lead up to the release of Phantom Liberty. The first and most recent stop was in Poland and a ton of details have come out of these sessions. I'm a fan of IGN and GameSpot and their coverage of games, but let's be honest, having players that know the game inside and out and know it's already been revealed is a big W for those of us fiending for new information. I even started a thread on Twitter polling my community to ask their experiences with the game, knowing that a lot of them were invited and you guys totally came through. So we're going to be highlighting some of these exclusive details as well. Big shout out to the accounts on screen here for these updates, you guys rock. So we all know that Dogtown is the new district in Night City, which happens to be a city within a city, but there's actually entirely new parts of the map opened up that are not part of Dogtown, and one that gives a big hint into an unpopular theory that we've been clinging to for a while now. According to Sherlotka, also known as Krushevitz on Twitter, shout out to you, there is an area on the map close to the Orbital Air Space Center that has been built out, with another one of my Twitter chooms confirming this with this image on the size and location. User Endersick has also verified this on Reddit, mentioning that you can go where the Orbital Air rockets launch. Now Orbital Air is a spaceflight company and our theory is that in Phantom Liberty we'll be going to the orbital habitat known as the Crystal Palace. We've seen Orbital Air in trailers, and we've seen potential hints of the Crystal Palace in the most recent trailer. So this just lends more credence to that theory. Now not only this, but it also does seem like the Badlands will be getting new real estate on the map as well, with new pads and roads built on the outskirts of Night City. I always felt like the Badlands was a bit neglected, so this is kinda nice to hear. As we know already, Dogtown will take up a substantial chunk of Pacifica, highlighted by this segment, but it does appear that Dogtown will be leveraging much more verticality than the existing districts. CDPR has also added new things around the rest of Night City, so new content additions are not exclusive to Dogtown or the new areas, which makes me hopeful that some of the buildings that are locked will be opened up for gigs, quests, and other activities. Some players did also mention that the devs informed them that gigs will feel more like side quests, and that there are new organized crime hideouts with new icons, which might be a rebranding of the NCPD scanner hustles or new activities altogether. There was literally nothing worse than going up to a building and getting that red flashing locked pop-up on your screen, and I know a lot of you guys feel the same. This also makes the North Oak Casino, which exists in the game as an unfinished asset, a potential location as well. A big complaint about Cyberpunk's open world was NPC reactivity and how alive it feels, and Cyber Vesna mentioned to me on Twitter that the environment is smart and that people react to V beyond just one canned response. Interactive NPCs seem to be confined to select ones with green circles around them on the minimap, but Vesna also mentions that there are quite a few of them, and some will even become a bit more aggressive and tell you to get lost if you're caught staring or standing too close. The base game did add NPCs with weapons who could shoot at you when threatened, so this seems to be in line with that, albeit with a bit more complexity. AI in general is something that we know will be tweaked, with enemies swarming Crush faster and discovering her quicker when she was attempting to use hacks. It also seems that the difficulty curve has in fact changed, which has been alluded to before by Pablo Sosco. Very hard is going to be much harder than it is right now. A small ask, but can we change very hard to something with a bit more life? I mean, The Witcher gets Death March. I think Cyberpunk 2077 should have some unique names for their difficulties. Now, pathing is something that was somewhat of a meme early on with NPCs clipping through walls, leading to the infamous platform 9 and 3 quarter Harry Potter Easter egg. But this has been adapted where NPC routes will be more organic. NPC crowds were also more dense in Dogtown, likely extending to the rest of the map. I actually think that NPC density in the base game is pretty insane if you max it out, especially in Watson and Corpo Plaza, so if Dogtown's market is even more dense, I can see this being a challenging game to run on the high settings. Still on the topic of AI, but let's loop in the Bargast and the new vehicle combat. The Bargast, which is the policing faction in Dogtown, will use vehicle combat. Endersick mentions here that he got two stars of notoriety after committing some crimes, and as a result, a Bargus patrol vehicle drove in and took him down. Again, speaking to the effectiveness of the AI. This was a random encounter as well, which hopefully means that the open world is more reactive and aggressive in ways that make sense. Vesna's thoughts also echo this sentiment, saying that the AI of the Bargus, which would extend to the NCPD and gangs, were smarter and stronger. Vesna panicked and died as a result, something that I feel is going to be much more common with the difficulty rework. 
The Vargas seem to be the most brutal and well-equipped faction in Night City, and you can allegedly hear terrified NPCs when they're around in the open world. I also want to mention that you won't simply be able to flee from the cops or the Vargas. They will hunt you down and look for you, and you can subvert this in a variety of ways, like listening into their next moves, swapping faces with new cyberware options, or being a super sneaky beaver and stealthing out of there with careful pathing. Some players did notice new melee moves and abilities from the Bargast, which is in line with the claim from CDPR that they're moving into more distinct archetypes for enemies. If you've been wondering about vehicle combat, driving is something that the team is looking into tweaking, despite it not being present in that build. And not only that, yes you can engage in vehicle combat in third person. This means that yes, you can wield a katana on a motorbike. All those hours of sword combat on the back of Roach will finally pay off for some of you. Cars in the current iteration of Cyberpunk 2077 all take the same amount of damage, but more feedback from the hands-on session conveys that luxury and hyper-class cars like the Caliburn will take a bigger beating than say a Mai Mai or an economy vehicle. Shooting a tire will cause it to explode and in one experiment a Herrera took three grenades and did not explode. In Cyberpunk's current state, two grenades and all vehicles are toast. Krushevitz mentions that she had the opportunity to drive what felt like a Mai Mai on steroids, and Adam on my Twitter thread mentions an outlaw GTS with a mounted machine gun that could only shoot forward making it hard to use. A comparable vehicle to the outlaw would be the JB700 from GTA. It did seem to sound more aggressive, so modifications to their sound design seems to have also happened. Unfortunately, vehicle customization is still not a feature, but there does seem to be a lot of new unique cars to play with. Let's talk about the level cap, which is confirmed to be raised to level 70. Now Witcher 3 had a cap of 100, which I would wager to bet most people didn't get to. The reason for this increased cap was the two expansions as well as New Game Plus, which won't be a feature in Cyberpunk 2077 due to implementation issues. I know a lot of you guys have been asking for New Game Plus, but it's extremely hard to balance so don't expect it. That being said, I think the level cap of 70 is pretty reasonable. You can do the theoretical math in your head about what that might mean for how much content we'll get in PL knowing that the base game cap is 50. Listen, this ain't Khan Academy, do the math on your own time. Players did mention that it does have the potential to be close in length to Blood and Wine, but that it is too hard to tell at the moment. Moving right along here, the menu and the UI has gotten an overhaul, most notably V's phone and what Adam mentions as a dynamic HUD. The former will see your contacts sorted alphabetically, thank god, but will also be split into categories like recent contacts, messages, and general contacts. Contacts will also respond to text more slowly, making it feel more natural than an instantaneous response. The latter will mean that your HUD will disappear when talking to characters. In the example listed, it was a conversation with President Myers. The FPP scene system is arguably one of my favorite parts of Cyberpunk 2077, and I think we can all appreciate just how great the facial animations were using the new Jolly tech in the base game. Across the board, facial animations and animations in general seem to be even more realistic with the update, with characters feeling and looking more alive. We haven't really talked about cyberware yet, so let's jump to that next. Installing cyberware will come with a small animation where you sit in a chair, select your upgrade, and then get up. The full animation of the installation process is not a feature, and won't be as elaborate as that first install with Victor, but it's still better than the existing system of you just standing there like a gong. Speaking of Vic, Adam also mentions that you will have a mission from Vic when you first load your save, helping onboard you into understanding the new cyberware mechanic where it's tied to your armor versus your clothes. If you load a save where V is fully chromed, you'll receive a message from Vic telling you to go to the nearest Ripper dock to redistribute. This was done because during playtesting, characters were experiencing such massive debuffs that they were instantly dying in fights. In my head, I figured the debuffs even at max capacity would have been minimal, but it does seem like they went full edge runners with this. Do remember that cyber psychosis is still not a mechanic, so don't expect something in line with the popular edge runner wannabe mod. Character customization allegedly will not be expanded, which is such an odd one for me knowing that they have touched so many of the main components of the game. I personally don't really care about this, but this is something I do see a lot of people disappointed about in my comments. Maybe they're saving this for DLC since the game is in first person, but yeah, this is kind of just a perplexing one to say the least. Netrunning has also received a facelift, as you can now combo them more effectively, by not having to wait to use another hack on the same enemy. It will be queued instead and will be activated in that sequence. CDPR have also distinguished between hacks that will expose your position, namely the combat hacks, and the ones where you won't be detected after using them. If you are detected after using a combat hack, but are not actually found yet, there will be a progress bar showing the time needed for enemies to find your position via the network. Every detectable hack used during this window will speed up this process for the enemy. 
Enemy Netrunners will also not just simply try to overheat you every time, they will try to jam your weapon and disable your cyberware. This one's a good one, the mono wire has also received its hacking functionality back, and we did see this back in the deep dive of 2018, so this is most likely what it will look like. I always felt like the mono wire was very one dimensional, so hopefully we can get some relic tree skills that will change how we use it as well. There also seem to be consumables akin to a booster where you can have your cyber deck ram be unlimited for a short period of time. The skill tree and the relic tree in particular is something that we'll talk about a bit more later on in the video, but as we know the base tree will receive a rework as well. The relic tree and the skills nested under it have both advantages and disadvantages, since they are more powerful than your regular skills, so you will need to take a measured approach with these. Relic points found in the open world are allegedly connected to hacking Militech terminals spread across Dogtown, which Reddit user Shavad likened to places of power from The Witcher. Just as an FYI, you will be able to reset your attributes as well. Again, this all sounds great, choices seem to matter much more from your skills to your cyberware, and hopefully this will make gameplay a little bit more dynamic. Moving right along here, Songbird will help you find relic points scattered across the map to spec into these skills, but apparently she isn't an engram like we initially thought, and is instead using a special protocol with the relic to communicate with V. She is mentioned as being much more of a skilled netrunner than T-Bug from the intro missions. Health was a big pain point for many in terms of gameplay, and I know I'm not alone when I say that I felt like I had to use a health inhaler every 5 seconds, especially in more oppressive districts or at higher difficulties. This has been changed and your health regen will be on a cooldown, as will your grenades. I guess we no longer have to craft a ridiculous amount of either of these, which is a good quality of life change. Crafting has apparently been reworked as well, although user Shavad who mentioned this change wasn't able to get hands on. When it comes to music, players noticed three new radio stations, one being the already confirmed Growl FM hosted by Sasha Gray. The second one is in the alternative genre, representative of Dogtown Citizen's mental state, and is described as fairly bizarre. The third will be a playlist selected by Idris Alba himself with a DJ. Disappointing news for some, but no new samurai songs will be added. Okay, miscellaneous points that I thought you guys would find interesting but didn't fit into any specific category. If you're wondering what build of the game this was, the demo was a build from around February and March. More content with Judy and Pan Am or other romances doesn't seem to be on the table, but CDPR has hinted we might get small stuff similar to what was seen in Blood and Wine from existing characters. A few brought up that this likely means some text, and at the most maybe a call or two. I hope we can hit him with the can't talk now babe, I'm in the middle of a war zone dialogue option. Interesting one that was picked up here, there are 4 new tarot cards as well, which might extend the fool on the hill quest in some way. The tarot card scene was the king of pentacles, I think that's how you say it, which is likely referring to Myers who is a crucial character in the story. Myers seems to be more of a Suburo Arasaka with max charisma, versus the uptight Corpo Meredith Stout which surprised some. Phantom Liberty will bring a new minigame based on Trauma Team and it's a similar side-scrolling style to Rotrace. Give me a Trauma Team Flappy Bird and I'll be a happy man personally. The ads in 2077 are all pretty amusing, I love them all. And there will be some quote familiar faces at the stadium according to Crush. Elephant in the room but when it comes to bugs, most players who commented on it did not see any, but we did hear about a game crash. I think we all know that Johnny is against the man, and if you swear allegiance to the NUSA, he does seem to get pretty salty. Swearing allegiance is done with a cutscene where you can either reject or accept the NUSA, and many players praise this scene and the scene system in general for the cinematic quality. It's positioned as the angel or devil scenario with Myers and Johnny. When you first meet Myers, you can also overpower her if you have enough points in body. If you don't meet this dialogue check, she can overpower you and push you down, which will change further dialogue options. As always, new weapons, new clothing, new cyberware to come, with some new clothing being associated with the Bargainist. Speaking of hype, I'm personally just as excited for PL as I was with the base release of Cyberpunk. It seems like the team is in high spirits as well, with Pablo Sasco tweeting that he hasn't been this excited for the release of a game he's contributed to for a long time. As a question in the Q&A to wrap up the Warsaw event, CDPR agreed with a commenter who suggested Phantom Liberty was a sort of Cyberpunk 2.0. Okay, so that was the long laundry list of new details and updates, so I gotta ask you guys, if you have to pick one feature you're most excited about, what would it be and why? Let me know in the comments below. The PL Tour has started off strong and the event itself looked pretty cozy and was nicely decorated, so if you have invites for the future get-togethers, this is kind of what you have to look forward to. Moving on, we have an event that CDPR was present at in Tokyo, where we got more insight into the relic tree. These images provided by viewers on Reddit show a skill within the relic tree, which a follower of mine on Twitter graciously translated. We already know that this is a unique tree where you have to scout for relic points in the open world and they grant super powerful bonuses like a barrage of rockets from your projectile launch system or power up your gorilla fist that can send your enemies flying. 
In this specific snapshot translated by Varium, we can read the description of one of the skills. During combat, you can now detect and see vulnerabilities in an enemy's armor and cyberware. Hitting a vulnerable point provides the following benefits. 100% chance to critically hit, plus 25% damage, and an armor piercing bonus and increased damage against these weak points. If you inflict enough damage to a vulnerability, it will trigger an EMP explosion that deals damage to enemies within a 3 meter radius. These sound incredibly unique, and I do believe that we've seen this skill in the gameplay snippets from the hands-on sessions with all sorts of weapons. The Mantis Blades give you a bigger target for these vulnerabilities, while Firearms give you smaller ones, and they are very reminiscent of the small red diamonds that target specific spots on enemies that you get with smart weapons. Remember that there are benefits and advantages to Relic Skills, so taking a measured approach with that and your cyberware should help you avoid the adverse effects. I really like that they're making us flex our decision making skills with these, especially since there were zero repercussions to borging out your character in the base game, which for an RPG just didn't seem right. Let's jump over to new stories in the cyberpunk universe, this coming via Rafael Kosick's new book No Coincidence, which just released August 8th, and an interesting new comic called Cyberpunk XOXO, written by Bartosz Tibor. I do have a review of Cyberpunk No Coincidence on the channel, and I'm currently stuck with three copies of the book since I got a soft and hardcover review copy and then totally forgot about the one I had pre-ordered. So as a reward for watching this video, I'll be giving one away. All you have to do is write in the comments what you're most looking forward to in Phantom Liberty, as well as have a Twitter account. Let me know both of these in the comments below and you'll be entered. Anyways, this 400 page novel is about a group of people blackmailed into participating into a heist and things get way out of hand, so if that sounds up your alley, check that one out. There's even an audiobook version voiced by Jeremy Lee, who is the voice of Female V. Now Cyberpunk is also building up a library of amazing comics. And this new one known as Cyberpunk 2077 XOXO, written by Bartosz Tibor, will be releasing on October 18th, and will follow a love story between a Maelstrom and a Mox member. Super interesting concept, probably my favorite cover out of all the Cyberpunk comics, and it's written by Edge Runners writer Bartosz, who we had the pleasure of interviewing right after the release of Edge Runners. With Phantom Liberty being less than 50 days away, and with Cyberpunk 2077 making an appearance at Gamescom, we're in the home stretch until release where we can finally be able to enjoy Cyberpunk's 2.0 update and the latest story expansion. I will leave you guys with new concept arts of Dogtown released by the official Cyberpunk 2077 Twitter channel. I hope you guys enjoyed this news update, it really does feel like the good old days of counting down till release and I'm thrilled all you tunes are here for this. Shout out to the community members who contributed on Reddit and in my Twitter thread, and do subscribe if you enjoyed the content.